Maybe just to counterbalance that uh, a little pessimistic <laughs> view towards the middle corridor uh, and its opportunities, maybe I'll uh, turn to you, Mohammed, and if you could um, um, tell us a bit about the Azerbaijan's perspective and uh, to connect it somehow with the, uh, with the connectivity agenda, which is directly linked to structural reforms challenges, and maybe that would be a chance for the, con the for the authoritarian countries along the middle corridor to introduce some changes. Yeah, sure. Um, I am not also that uh, that optimistic, but yeah, I'll try. I'll try to do my best. Um, I, I thank my colleagues for very, very comprehensive and insightful comments and both economic and geopolitical aspects. I'll try to cover mostly Azerbaijani perspective, how Azerbaijan sees the Middle Corridor as part of its um, regional positioning. Of course, we have to mention Russia's invasion of Ukraine and destabilization of um, traditional railroads passing through Russia, which is called Northern Corridor, that, that uh, suddenly increased uh, Middle Corridors in general and Azerbaijan's position substantially after 2022. So for Azerbaijan, economically and for domestic reasons, um, I think a Middle Corridor is a very huge chance to diversify its economy from away from dependence on, on oil and gas revenues. And currently, if you follow Azerbaijani government narratives, you, you'll see that it's renewables. Now, Azerbaijan this November is hosting COP29 event, and renewables is the key area, and transit and connectivity that Azerbaijani government thinks as part of its strategy to decrease dependence on oil and gas. And in, I think most importantly, it's geopolitical. Um, uh, as you know, especially after Second Karabakh War, Azerbaijan had gone through very complicated relations, uh, uh, very complicated issues in its relations with both EU and Russia. And so the Middle Corridor was an opportunity to strengthen ties with both of them, again, because as, as you know, Azerbaijan is pursuing mostly balanced foreign policy between the EU and Russia. So with the EU, um, as, as, as Russia started to weaponize its gas exports, the Southern Gas Corridor began to be very important, and Mrs. von der Leyen was in Baku in July 2022 signing Memorandum of Understanding that will increase double Azerbaijani gas exports to the EU to 20 billion cubic meters by 2027. And uh, on the Connectivity-wise, of course, uh, Middle Corridor um, began to emerge as an alternative to not only Northern Corridor, but uh, as we discussed, to the Southern Corridor passing through Iran. Uh, in general, the, the transit through Iran is not that, that, uh, that attractive because, as you know, Iran is, has long been under sanctions and Iran's uh, rail, rail, rail infrastructure is not that well developed and integrated in, with the regional uh, neighboring countries. Uh, yes, with Turkmenistan there are connections, but the most substantial link is with Turkey. In Turkey, as you know, Iranian railways, uh, the cargo comes and in the one lake, it must be multimodal. It, uh, model. It, pass, it should pass with ships and it takes time. And as you know, in the eastern part of Turkey, the rail infrastructure is not that well developed. It's actually one of the bottlenecks of the middle corridor. From Kars to Ankara, rail, uh, rail uh, infrastructure is not that well developed. Um, also, Middle Corridor opened the ways to increase Azerbaijan's importance for Russia, interestingly, and it increased Azerbaijan's leverage in its relations with Russia, especially on Karabakh issue. And as you know, a few weeks ago, Russian troops withdrew from Karabakh. I think it's uh, the first time in the post-Soviet space and uh, in those conflict centers that Russia is withdrawing from a conflict region, and I hope that soon Armenia will follow. As you know, in August, um, uh, FSB uh, uh, um, uh, guards will are expected to withdraw Armenians at uh, Zvarnots airport. Um, so I think when we discuss Middle Corridor, one of the most important shifts uh, previously discussed is first EU's and China's involvement. I mean, before, yes, there are some discussions that EU was interested and China was interested, but for both of them it was the second option. But now the first time the EU, as in previous discussions was mentioned, committed 10 billion euros. It's just open commitment that the European Union is interested. And China, in July 2023, there was the first ever China C plus C5 uh, leader summit in Xi'an that uh, uh, Xi Jinping for the first time openly endorsed the Middle Corridor. So it shows that China will in the long term be pledged to the development of the Middle Corridor. This is very important because uh, Middle Corridor is mostly between China and 
um, China and the EU. But at the same time, paradoxically, now the middle corridor is being shifted, I mean, as seen as not only as a mere transit between the EU and China, but as an economic corridor between, uh, uh, by economic corridor, I am not only mean, meaning goods, but it, it will be energy, and there will be some discussion with Kazakhstan and EU that uh, green hydrogen can be exported from Kazakhstan and Central Asian countries. And now, as you so Azerbaijan um, joined its electricity grid system with Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, so in the near future, uh, Central Asian electricity can be exported to the EU. As you know, in, uh, with Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, Romania, and Hungary recently signed an agreement that Azerbaijan renewable electricity from Azerbaijan renewables will be exported to the EU. So it shows that it will not be just a transit route, but a full-fledged economic corridor. In uh, an analogy, I can say this uh, India-Middle East corridor also, between the uh, connecting India to the West uh, against China, that it's not only about like transport connectivity, but also Middle Eastern uh, green hydrogen and uh, electricity and then uh, Israeli gas to the EU. So, I mean, it's very full-fledged economic corridor. And uh, it will also um, de deepen uh, trade cooperation between the regional countries. I'll bring it to Azerbaijan and Armenia because... Um, I don't know if Robert mentioned Crossroads of Peace, Armenia's project to open transportation links with Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan calls it Zangizur Corridor. And I think that uh, th this opening of this route can create in, uh, some economic in interdependence of sorts that uh, would not only increase the regional connectivity, but also peace dividends, yeah? So, um, um, t yesterday, a uh, Deputy Secretary of State for uh, European and Ex um, Eurasian Affairs, Mr. O'Brien, was in Baku. He said that it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for Armenia and Azerbaijan to use this uh, Russia's weakness uh, to open this corridor. Now, it seems that the West is also behind this project, and there is huge hopes that it would both help both Armenia and Azerbaijan to diversify their trade links and at the same time normalize their relations better in the near future. So uh, very briefly about what Azerbaijan has done so far to develop the Middle Corridor. Uh, Baku increased the number of ships in the, middle, uh, in the Caspian Sea. Um, Azerbaijan has its own shipping company that it's not dependent on Russia for buying those ships. Uh, yes, the capacity of those ships to uh, increase the cargo turnover is questionable, but yet uh, it's something. Azerbaijan invested um, one, uh, $100 million uh, to Georgian part of the baku tbilisi Kars Railroad, which will increase its capacity from 1 million tons to 5 million, and it became operational just uh, last month. And uh, Azerbaijan, uh, in cooperation with Kazakhstan and uh, Georgia, put two ships in the Black Sea that will connect Azerbaijan, uh, Georgia's ports of Poti and Batumi with Borgas in Bulgaria and uh, Constanta in, uh, in Romania. I think the most uh, biggest, I mean, the biggest bottlenecks are in soft infrastructure part, um, because uh, these countries need to need some regulatory approximation to provide a smooth transfer of cargo along the route. So we have a roadmap signed in 2022, November, that these countries say that, okay, we will, uh, uh, we will bring our regulation closer to each other that, so that cargo will not uh, stay longer in the ports. And as you mentioned, we, uh, they established lo joint logistics operator. As you know, the major advantage of the Northern Corridor has been that it, it was part of the Eurasian Economic Union, there was no customs, and at the same time, they had joint rail, rail, uh, railroad operator uh, under Russian railways. Now, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Kazakhstan agreed the same mechanism that will regulate tariffs, common tariffs, and uh, hopefully it will decrease the transit times in the ports and railways. And uh, finally, um, uh, again, yeah, uh, the biggest issue is soft infrastructure, and the hope is that the EU's recent allocation of 10 billion euros will be a huge, uh, significant contributor. But when we read the policy documents, the two most important of them is an EBRD report in July and, and the World Bank report in November, both of them very insightful comments, but you don't see the South Caucasus in neither of them. Maybe it's one of the weaknesses of those, and we, we should talk more about, uh, about the South Caucasus because it is the main bottleneck. The first one is Armenia-Azerbaijan normalization. There are some tensions, and we need to solve them. And the other one is, of course, the deteriorating relations between Georgia and its Western partners and China's more active involvement. So it creates a huge 
huge uncertainty. And, uh, and I, I'll just add, conclude with this uh, unpopular idea that um, right now, geopolitically, the main bottleneck about the Middle Corridor is uncertainty. I'm sure that both South Caucasus and Central Asian republics are thinking about what, how the EU-Russia relations will go after the end of the war in Ukraine. Because in 2008 and 2014, Russia occupied Georgia, and Russia occupied in Ukrainian territories, and then we saw normalization and business as usual between Russia and the European great powers. And now, and these countries are looking at if they should commit themselves to risky, let's say, balancing moves which irritate both Russia and China. And what, 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 what will happen if t tomorrow you see that EU is returning back to, which is highly unlikely, but still you, it's like the worst case scenario you have to think about. So yeah, this, this creates a huge uncertainty because just a quick note, uh, after 2022 February, the, most of the Western logistics companies shifted to the middle corridor. And then, it, because in February there was a huge uncertainty. But in summer, just after two months, we saw that as, as, as some companies knew that, yes, they can work with Russian railways because Russian railways is still not, not under sanctions. So they, some of them moved back. So these countries are looking at, okay, yes, we are cooperating, we are doing a lot of stuff and irritating Russia, but still there is this possibility that tomorrow um, they can be put in a difficult spot due to these uh, maneuvering. Thank you. Thank you very much.